of the business committee this debate is interrupted i call gareth hughes to make his maiden statement my first words in this house are going to be about hope for as a green what motivates me is hope for a fairer and more prosperous future as a father i am hope for a safer world for my son to inherit and as a young person i am hope for a hopeful for a new zealand which i can continue to be proud of this evening i am going to introduce myself and use my personal story to illustrate why i'm passionate about green politics and optimistic about the future as the youngest member in this house i represent a generational shift both in this parliament and in the green party caucus i was born in 1981 in a very different new zealand 28 years ago <laughs> 28 years ago we had 3 million people and 7 million sheep. You needed to get a doctor's prescription to buy margarine and we had a very different national party prime minister. One who was thinking big, if also a little sloppy. In 1981, my hometown like the rest of New Zealand was split with conflict over the racist Springbok tour. It was also in 1981 the honorable leader of the opposition entered this house. Like people of my generation, I don't remember the 1984 general election which ushered in so much change. This revolutionary transformation of the political and social consensus in New Zealand was on a par with the liberal, vogel and first labor government reforms which were such historical milestones. 1984 was a long, long time ago now. In 2010, I am hopeful we are on the cusp of another change. another revolutionary transformation i'm looking forward to the opportunity of working with the green party and this parliament to shift us from a dirty unfair old fashioned economic model to an innovative sustainable fair economy i grew up in gisborne more boy racer than bohemian i loved cars wanted to be an all black and remember laughing at my recently turned vegetarian friend that he was just a poser and i'd never be one While environmental issues weren't top of the agenda at home, at school, or in the media, I was acutely aware at the time of social issues like inequality, like unemployment. In the late 1980s, due in part to the Roger Nomic reforms, my father, along with many locals, was made redundant at the local freezing works. I worked from an early age as a pamphlet deliverer, pushing trolleys in the supermarket and in a fish and chip store because it was necessary. It wasn't till I left home to study religion and history at Victoria University and personally contribute my $30,000 to the more than 9 billion national student debt that I was exposed to the most radical political idea of the last 50 years. The earth isn't growing. Sure it sounds simple and common sense, but when you stop and think that our entire economic system is dependent on infinite growth on a finite planet The most serious symptom of our addiction to growth is climate change. You don't need a weatherman to say which way the wind blows and you don't need a climatologist to say which way the temperature goes. We need better ways of living because we don't have a planet B. To quote George Monbiot, humanity is no longer split between liberals and reactionaries, progressives and conservatives. Both sides are informed by the older politics, but today the battle lines are drawn between expanders and restrainers. those who believe there should be no impediments to growth and those who believe we must live within limits from this understanding i became a passionate environmentalist in my 20s like so many ordinary kiwis i got active and i campaigned from helping stop genetically engineered food sneaking onto our dinner plates to directly stopping bottom trawlers wiping out an un- amazing undersea world from the rainbow warrior to most recently coordinating the sign on campaign for greenpeace where more than 200,000 kiwis called on the prime minister to do the right thing for the climate the 1999 election was a turning point for me it was so exciting and empowering to see people like me talk about the things i cared about in this house mmp meant there were no, no longer were decisions just made by white middle-aged men in smoky back rooms mmp helped more people to be represented in this the house of representatives and i contend also better decisions i grew up in the region known as poverty bay 241 years ago poverty bay had a different more hopeful name 
On the 6th of October, 1769, Nicholas Young, the surgeon's boy, on the ship the Endeavour, sighted the coastline of New Zealand and also the thriving settlement of Taranganui Akiwa. We teach the discovery of New Zealand in schools, but like an embarrassing family secret, we prefer to forget or to downplay that on first contact on that day, Temaru of Ngāti Onioni was killed by English musket fire and as petty recompense, three iron nails were left on his corpse. History is a passion of mine and can sometimes reveal inconvenient truths. Many New Zealanders wouldn't know Māori had a declaration of independence, wouldn't know a treaty clause and wouldn't know that Tenaranga Teratanga or sovereignty wasn't ceded in a treaty. It was taken at the point of a musket. To take my seat in the House last week, I had to pledge allegiance to the Queen, and I look forward to the day when we can reform our constitution, to ditch the monarchy, to centralise our political structures, and see genuine Tenaranga Teratanga for Tanga de Whenua. Two years ago, I became a dad, and I want my son to grow up knowing his history, eating safe food, and enjoying a stable climate and a prosperous economy. Though our politics differ, I know all members in the House want these things for all Kiwi kids. But why are governments of both colours failing? This government, like Labour before, ignores the warnings of the end of cheap oil, it blithely builds more motorways, chronically underinvests in public transport, walking and cycling, and perpetuates the housing crisis that sees people of my generation forced out of affordable home ownership. As different as Coke is to Pepsi, they both ignore the crisis in the oceans, depend on debt to fuel growth, and to continue to support growing inequality. In desperation, the current government is hunting the last protected places for coal. Mining companies can already mine in 87% of New Zealand, and the national government, by opening up the last 13%, is undoing their own wise decision from 1997. Mining the national parks is like burning the furniture to keep warm. For a career, I've been privileged and proud to be a climate campaigner. I'm passionate on working towards finding the solutions to climate change. It's one of the most fascinating issues facing humanity at the moment. In a way, it's a tragedy it's just seen as an environmental issue. Last year, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan reported that 300,000 people die right now, every year, as a result of climate change. Man's massive and growing release of greenhouse gases is a people issue. It's an economic issue, a social justice issue, a spiritual issue. It's not just about the polar bears and the penguins. At issue is the future of humanity as we know it. With the growth in emissions, especially for more cars, cows and coal, the new, all the New Zealanders of my son's generation rightfully ask of us in this house tonight, what did you do when you had the chance? Could future leaders accuse us in this house of willful neglect? Could ministers be put on the dock for crimes against the planet? From Coupe to Cook to Sir Ed, we've been a can-do, forward-looking nation. As Kiwi as Pavlova, Kiwis are prepared to play our part and to do the right thing. Yet when it comes to the climate crisis, a crisis bigger than Mount Everest, governments, both Labour and National, instead of putting one foot after the other to scale the challenge, instead get knocked by the bugger. They put corporate and short-term interests ahead of same with the climate. As Sir Nicholas Stern pointed out, sure it's expensive to tackle climate change, but considerably cheaper than paying the costs. One person in particular who epitomised the hope and the realism of the green vision was Jeanette Fitzsimons. People keep telling me, boy, those are big shoes to fill, but I prefer to consider them strong shoulders to stand on. Jeanette was a pioneer, and over the last 10 years, the Greens have grown from the fresh-faced new kids on the block to a respected, effective and principled party. I am now the first Green MP who hasn't sat in the House with either Rod or Jeanette. The Greens are growing. New faces, new energies, new issues, but the same values. Surrounded by my colleagues, I know that the vision of a peaceful, democratic, greener and fairer Aotearoa New Zealand will continue. It's an exciting time to enter this House. The time for bandages, step changes and tinkering is ending. A new generation is entering politics and they are optimistic about the future but turned off by the petty parliamentary point scoring and the vacuous, visionless politics espoused by our leaders. I will work constructively with any party in this House and any person on issues we can together. I'm not here for the petty points, 
or the tribal battle. I believe my generation wants less partisan politics.